No my hooky my. Welcome back to LCA 2022. Code Joel I'm Joel. If you're just joining us, welcome to LCA. Um, we have with us Fraser Tweedle, who is another fellow Red Hatter based out of Brisbane. Uh, Fraser works on security and identity solutions at Red Hat, and today he's going to be telling us about an upcoming and already delivered kernel and Kubernetes security features that enable for better container isolation and secure deployment of systemd-based workloads. No, my Fraser, take no it away. I. So, uh, welcome to my presentation, and thanks to everyone, uh, especially those attending live, because in this particular time slot, uh, there's gold in them, their tracks. And uh, I'm a little resentful to have to present in this time slot. Uh, some of those other presos are great. So good luck to them also. And let's get into it. So this talk is Creative Commons attribution licensed, except where otherwise noted. The slides are available now. And uh, if you're the sort of person who likes to follow the links, and open up two dozen tabs uh, to go deep after or during the Prezo. Uh, there are hyperlinks in the PDF. So uh, go grab the PDF from Speaker Deck uh, and you can follow along from there. And I will be available in the chat room and in the general conference chat rooms following my presentation uh, if we have questions that uh, we don't have time to address during this time slot. So today I will talk um, briefly about containers, what they are, and container standards. And I will give an overview of Kubernetes and OpenShift, particularly with respect to their container runtimes. Uh, these are huge products. There's no way to cover uh, even a sizable chunk of them in depth. So we just have to focus on this one specific area of the runtime. Then I'll talk about free IPA, which is the application that is the subject of uh, my team's efforts. And we'll conclude by talking about system D based workloads on Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, what are the challenges and the workarounds and the solutions to run them? So what is a container? Ask uh, 10 different people. You might get 10 different answers and they might all be correct answers because the concept of a container is really an abstraction uh, of, over uh, isolation and confinement mechanisms. Most commonly, when people are talking about containers, they're talking about some OS level virtualization where all of the uh, containers or the containerized processes uh, share the host kernel. So it's the host kernel running everything, but presenting to the confined processes a restricted view of the system and uh, imposing resource limits. Non-Linux implementations of OS-level virtualization include FreeBSD jails and Solaris zones. Uh, it's important to make a distinction between the container, which is actually the, the confinement mechanisms and the processes running in that environment from container images. So if you're talking about uh, Docker files and building a container, what you're really talking about is building a container image, which defines the file system contents uh, intended for use in or with a container, as well as metadata about how that container should be run, such as what process needs to be run, uh, the setting of environment variables and similar things. On Linux, containers uh, usually consist of a bunch of uh, disparate security mechanisms offered by the kernel, including namespaces, and there are different kinds of namespaces, uh, namespaces for PIDs or process IDs, mount namespaces, network device namespaces, C group namespace, and there are some other kinds. And uh, each of those kinds of namespace will present a restricted view to the namespace process or processes. For example, in a PID namespace, uh, a process running in that namespace can see other PIDs inside that namespace but uh, nothing outside the namespace. Uh, mount namespace uh, has a, a dedicated mount table for the processes in that namespace, and uh, manipulating that mount table won't affect uh, the mount tables in other mount namespaces, and manipulating the system mount table also 
uh, will not affect the uh, container's mount table. A container may include SE Linux uh, or App Armor uh, confinement. Uh, those are mandatory access control mechanisms. And uh, a container may use capabilities or sec comp to restrict what the uh, process can do uh, in terms of system calls. So uh, what system calls uh, are allowed or what arguments are allowed in a system call or potentially modifying the behavior of particular system calls. Now recently, the Open Container Initiative, which is uh, an initiative of the Linux Foundation, has been uh, specifying and developing specifications for various aspects of this whole container ecosystem. Uh, the one we're going to talk about today is the runtime specification. They also have specifications for the uh, image format and other things. The runtime specification is uh, a specification for a low-level runtime interface. Uh, it is not Linux specific, so it um, in, encompasses uh, Solaris containers, Windows containers, even virtual machines treating VMs uh, as a kind of container uh, within the OCI uh, definition of the container abstraction. OCI implementations include RunC, which is their reference implementation for Linux. Uh, CRun is another Linux implementation. And uh, Carter Containers is uh, an implementation of the uh, virtual machine instantiation of a container. The runtime specification uses a JSON configuration format. It's quite verbose, but uh, there's a link here to an example if you want to see that. Uh, the general things that will be specified for any container include the mounts, uh, the process that should be executed and its environment, and lifecycle hooks for running commands either on the host, on the container host, uh, or inside the container upon container start, stop, uh, creation, destruction, etc. And the Linux specific uh, tunables for a container include uh, capability sets, so restricting the uh, capability bounding set for the container, uh, what namespaces should be used or should be uh, created anew for that container, uh, what C group the container should live in, sys controls that should be set, set comp profile, and similar things. So now let's talk about uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. So Kubernetes is a container orchestration system. Uh, if you see K8S or Kates written, that's an abbreviation for Kubernetes. Kubernetes uh, works with a, a cluster of machines uh, with distributed configuration and uh, distributing the uh, application workloads across the cluster. And it has a declarative configuration format, uh, typically using JSON or YAML if you're interacting with the system as a human. Uh, but also there are uh, APIs for most languages you could poke a stick at, uh, in particular Go, but also Python and Haskell uh, and many other languages. It has integration with uh, most cloud providers, including the, the big obvious ones. All the Kubernetes uh, documentation, blog posts, uh, tutorials, guides, uh, etc., live at kubernetes.io. And uh, the GitHub homepage is github.com slash Kubernetes. That's where all of the source code lives. So some of the terminology that uh, we need to use today, uh, and again, we're focusing mainly on this area of the, the runtime. Um, there, there are many, 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 many other things that we have no time to cover today. So a container is uh, an isolated or confined process or process tree. Uh, it may be a, you know, a Windows container, a Linux container, a VM-based container. Um, that's really up to how that workload will be sandboxed. A pod is a group, one or more related containers. Uh, so a, uh, a typical uh, example would be some HTTP application, and then its database, you know, Apache and MySQL, uh, bundled together in a pod as a single application. But the different components are actually uh, separate containers within the pod. A namespace is uh, a scope for 
um, for objects, and it's also an, an authentication and authorization scope, uh, such as for uh, a single application or team or project. And uh, the nodes are the machines in the clusters where the pods are executed. Typically, there are two kinds of nodes. Uh, one class is the control plane nodes, where the logic that is Kubernetes that manages all of the networking and pod scheduling uh, and auto scaling logic, all of that stuff lives in the control plane or the master nodes, they're also called. And then there are the worker nodes, which is where the uh, business applications running on the cluster will be executed. On a node, the agent that executes a pod is called Kubelet. So Kubelet uh, observes the distributed configuration, and if it sees that a particular pod has been scheduled to it or has been uh, removed from it, then it will affect those changes on that node. It does that by creating uh, a sandbox. A uh, sandbox is the isolation or confinement mechanism or mechanisms to be used for a pod. Uh, one pod, one sandbox. All of the containers for a pod, if there are multiple, will run inside the same sandbox. And the container runtime interface is the interface uh, that Kubelet uses to talk to a container runtime uh, and tell it to create, start, stop, and destroy sandboxes and containers. Two implementations for Linux include Cryo and Containerd. So visualizing this, this whole thing, this whole diagram is one Kubernetes node. On the left, we have Kubelet, and Kubelet talks to a CRI runtime uh, using CRI, which has a, a protobuf uh, wire format. And then the CRI runtime will do something to, uh, to create and manage the containers as requested by Kubelet. So if we instantiate the abstract CRI runtime as cryo now, uh, then Cryo uh, is, a, is a program that uses an OCI runtime to manage the containers. Now you can plug in different OCI runtimes. So we'll go a step further and we'll say, well, um, we can use run C for that. And so now we have kind of this fully instantiated uh, container runtime setup. Uh, that is one way that you could do it in a Kubernetes node, a different distributions uh, of Kubernetes will use different uh, CRI runtimes and potentially if they're using an OCI runtime, uh, it might be run C or it might be C run or, or it might be something else. I mentioned that the uh, definitions are declarative. And so here's a very simple pod definition. Uh, we have the kind field, which says what kind of object it is. This is, this is the YAML. Um, uh, serialization of this data, but uh, you, know, you could work with it with JSON or, or many other formats. Uh, in the pod spec, we have a list of containers. Uh, in this case, the list has one container, and we have to specify a container image, uh, which will be a reference to some image registry where the cluster can uh, pull the container image from. And we may also specify uh, the command to execute uh, environment variables to set. You don't always need to set these because uh, these uh, may have default values specified in the image metadata, but you can uh, set them in the pod spec or override them if you need to. OpenShift, uh, also called OpenShift Container Platform or OCP, is Red Hat's commercially supported enterprise container platform. It's based on Kubernetes. There's also uh, an upstream distribution called OKD. The latest stable release is version 4.9. And uh, it's no coincidence that in the diagram previously, I used Cryo and Run C as the example because those are the components used in uh, OpenShift. All existing Kubernetes terminology applies in OpenShift and there are additional concepts uh, in OpenShift. With respect to uh, the runtime and pods, the two that you need to know about today are projects, which extend the namespace concept uh, with additional uh, attributes and metadata. Uh, 
and security context constraints, uh, which are policies that affect the SE Linux context of a pod, the seccomp profile, the capability bounding set, the user IDs that the container can run as, and similar, uh, similar mechanisms. So the OpenShift runtime environment today uses SE Linux for confinement. Uh, it creates sandboxes with a set of namespaces, including a unique C group namespace, a PID namespace, mount namespaces, UTS namespace, which allows setting a different host name, different kernel U name, and some other uh, attributes, and network devices. Each project in an OpenShift cluster gets assigned a unique user ID range. And by default, any container uh, that is part of a pod within that project's namespace must run as a user ID from that range. The range is something large, you know, it might be 1 billion to 1 billion and 10,000 or something like that. Uh, and it's unique per project in the cluster. These restrictions can be circumvented via the run as user uh, property, which is part of the pod spec. You can request that it be run as a different user. Uh, but in creating that pod, you also have to do that via an account that has permission to use SCCs that allow that pod to be run as root on the host or as some other uh, low valued user ID on the host rather than a UID from the assigned range for that namespace. This is usually a very bad idea because if you're running as root on the host, even with these other kinds of confinement, um, if you break out of your SE Linux confinement or you can escape your mount namespace, uh, your, your root on the node, uh, basically your node and your cluster are owned. So it's uh, not something that we want to be doing, especially as people uh, working on and developing a very security minded and security sensitive project. Okay, what's that project? Free IPA. So Free IPA is an open source identity management solution. Uh, that means that you can define your users, groups and services uh, in your organization. It provides authentication mechanisms and lets you define and enforce access policies. Free IPA is made up of a lot of moving parts, uh, several of which are very large, mature, independent projects in their own right. So these components include 389DS, which is our database and LDAP server, MIT Kerberos, which is uh, an implementation of the Kerberos authentication protocol. We have uh, an HTTP API and also a web UI, and uh, these are uh, um, provided by an application running behind an Apache reverse proxy. We have DogTag PKI, which is a, an X509 certificate authority. SSSD is a client component that provides authentication mechanisms and user lookup facilities to uh, applications running on an enrolled host. And those are, those are the main moving parts, but uh, there are others. Free IPA is available as part of RHEL, uh, and so is commercially supported as part of RHEL. And we have Fedora, where we uh, do all of our upstream development. Uh, features land there first, usually and uh, we have community support. FreeIPA.org is the website if you want to learn more. Why do we want to run it on uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift? Well, as organizations move more applications onto container orchestration systems like OpenShift, then they may also wish to have the identity management system providing the identity services that those applications need running alongside those applications on the cluster. The cluster itself also has identity needs. Uh, you need to have users and groups uh, within the OpenShift cluster itself, and you might want to tie that in with your uh, identity management system for your organization, or you might want to deploy your identity management system for your organization on an OpenShift cluster.
Also for access to the nodes directly in OpenShift, uh, everything, all the nodes are uh, Red Hat Coros nodes as previously Atomic. So they're immutable systems. And uh, currently the way you would log onto a node is via a debug shell or uh, via SSH, but there's a single user account. Uh, and that's not really adequate for organizations in highly regulated industries like telcos, banking, government, etc. So there is actually a need for proper identity management and uh, access control mechanisms for logging onto the nodes of a cluster as well. Finally, uh, there's this idea that you might want to offer identity management systems as a service. So a service provider, which in the future may be Red Hat, maybe someone else, maybe multiple companies uh, offering free IPA as a turnkey managed service where an organization says, yes, we, we're going to need free IPA for our organization. I have an account with a cloud provider. I can see it in the service catalog. Um, you know, click OK, deploy. And a short time later, the identity management system is set up. And uh, we can give the keys to the customer. And uh, typically, these will be deployed on the service provider's own infrastructure managed by the service provider and co-tenanted. So multiple different customers with their uh, application instances living side by side on the cluster. So if we want to start doing this sort of thing, uh, we need containers for free IPA. We need to put this stuff in a container so we can run it in a container orchestration system. And our current approach is to encapsulate the whole RHEL or Fedora-based system in a container, wrapping everything up together where uh, PID1, the container's entry point, will be system D. And just as if you were deploying on a VM or bare metal, system D will start and monitor all the services that need to be brought up uh, on that uh, application instance. This is a very stark contrast from a microservice architecture, or you might have heard the buzzword cloud native, uh, where all of the main components of the application would be running as separate containers within, within a pod, or maybe even in separate pods, uh, wired up to talk to each other, to do all the things they need to do, but all of them running uh, separately rather than together in a single sandbox. Uh, we're doing the exact opposite. We call it the, a monolithic container. I don't know if there's any better or established terminology for what we're trying to do. I think there might not be because usually when we talk to people about this, there are howls of dismay and you know, why would you do it like that? And that's not how you're supposed to build applications. Um, but, but we have reasons to avoid doing it if we can. First of all, it's a very big upfront engineering effort to re-architect free IPA to be cloud native, to, to break everything up. As I mentioned, a lot of the components of free IPA are big legacy projects in their own right, making all kinds of assumptions about how they're deployed, um, you know, what users they're running as. So, uh, and many of these projects, uh, Red Hat uh, is just a contributor to among many. Um, we don't steer all of the projects that we actually use as part of free IPA. So it's not only a, an engineering effort, but also a political effort to make the changes that we would need um, to do this. Furthermore, we would face uh, an increase in ongoing costs as we support free IPA with two completely different application architectures. Why? Because free IPA is available in RHEL. We commercially support RHEL uh, and the existing releases, the near future releases are going to use the status quo uh, application architecture and deployment paradigm. So we need to support that for five years minimum, probably realistically more like 10 years. So we face significant ongoing costs um, if we have to re-architect free IPA and um, basically build it in a completely different way for the cloud. Now, if we were starting from scratch today, it's a no brainer, of course, we would do it in the cloud native way. But free IPA is an old project. 
things were done differently back then. It's not anything to criticise. It's just a reality of uh, of where we're at as a team and, and the business uh, consequences for the different decisions uh, that we have to make. So to do what we want to do, unsurprisingly, there are many challenges. Some of the main areas are the runtime, and that's what I'm going deep on in this presentation. Some challenges with volumes and mounts and um, dealing with uh, mounts that are not necessarily owned by root in the container and um, yeah, just various assumptions about the file system that, that don't necessarily hold in a cloud environment. Uh, and ingress, so that's getting traffic to the cluster. Free IPA uses some, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of applications today are just HTTP and that's it. Well, Free IPA uses LDAP and Kerberos. We um, use SRV records for service discovery. We have services that use both TCP and UDP to communicate. And uh, I've got some links there to some blog posts where I have uh, written about some of the uh, challenges that we have with ingress, but that is a whole other talk, maybe next year. So for the runtime, what are the challenges and what are the workarounds and solutions? The first one is that systemd and other components in free IPA, and you can abstract this to any kind of quote unquote legacy application that you might want to bundle up um, in a monolithic container and run on Kubernetes or OpenShift. So in these situations for these applications, they may be expecting to run as root or some other specific UID. Uh, and by default on uh, Kubernetes or an OpenShift cluster, that's not going to happen. It's going to, uh, by default, try and run your application as some unprivileged UID. So a possible solution to this is user namespaces, yet another kind of namespace that, um, that abstracts uh, and constrains the hosts or the parent user namespace and uh, maps those, maps a range of host user IDs to a range of container UIDs potentially starting at a different number, say zero root. So this is supported in the OCI runtime spec and OCI uh, runtime implementations and in Cryo, the version that shipped in OpenShift 4.7, there is an annotation-based user namespace feature. So uh, via a pod annotation and assuming the cluster is configured to support this behavior or to enable this behavior, then you can cause your pod to be executed in its own user namespace. At the moment, this requires the pod to be admitted to the cluster by an account that can use the NEUID SCC or a similar SCC that allows pods to be run as uh, root or as privileged users on the host. Um, now, the workload itself will not run as those users. It's a workaround because the Kubernetes API and the Kubernetes uh, data model have no awareness yet of user namespaces. So visualizing this, um, you have a host user namespace, which is zero through two to the 32. And uh, some slice of this namespace uh, can be mapped to a particular process, which may be a container. So here we have container A. Inside the container, there's a range of user IDs, zero through 65535. So if you're running as user 200,000 on the host inside that user namespace, that will appear to be root. Um, or you can think of it vice versa. So for, contain for container B, um, the process that within the container is running as UID zero is actually in the host user namespace running as user ID uh, 265,536. Uh, once your cluster is configured to support user namespaces to actually uh, enable the use of this feature or opt into it in the pod spec, you need to specify a couple of annotations. Um, so this io.openshift builder true, this uh, just um, says to the container runtime, uh, I'm a container, I want to run in builder mode and in builder mode, uh, user namespaces is enabled. 
And then you also have to specify the user in S mode annotation, which says, okay, how do I actually want to generate the mapping of host user IDs to container user IDs? One of these modes is auto. That's the most convenient option and the most secure option because it just allows you to say what size you need. Uh, so I want a UID range of 65536 and it will find uh, an available uh, portion of the host user ID uh, range and map that to the container. Kubernetes itself has no support for user namespaces, but it is a long running and ongoing discussion. Um, the first proposal was maybe two or three years ago, and there've been a few iterations uh, there's a fair bit of discussion about it at the moment with this third um, proposal, number 3065. Uh, I still need to catch up on this. Uh, this was only sort of over December and Christmas, so I need to get up to date with what's actually happening in the Kubernetes upstream uh, in terms of user namespace support. Okay, so that's user namespaces. The next challenge is C groups. So OpenShift creates a unique C group for each container and it creates a C group namespace for that container, which makes the container's C group appear to be the root namespace, the root, uh, sorry, not namespace, the root C group inside the container. Uh, so when you mount the C group FS, uh, what it appears inside the container as sys FS C group will actually be sys uh, fsc group uh, kubepods dot scope slash kubepods dash best effort dot scope slash blah 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 some container id some deeply nested uh, c group for the specific container and in order to bring up the system and do the service management system d needs write access to the c group to create new scopes and slices but it doesn't have it so the solution well let's modify the runtime so that it will uh, change the owner of the C group to the user ID that's actually running the container process. So I implemented this, uh, I submitted a pull request and during the discussion and review of that pull request, people were pointing out, well, um, C run, one of the other runtimes, C run already does this. And we were discussing that there were discrepancies uh, between what different runtimes were doing in this regard. The conclusion was, well, let's, define a semantics for C group ownership in the OCI runtime spec. So I shelved that pull request, uh, went and made proposals to the OCI runtime spec to define this semantics. There was some discussion about it. Eventually that pull request was accepted. Um, and after that, then we were able to get the run C pull request merged. So what is the semantics? Uh, if and only if C groups V2 is in use, and the container has its own C group namespace and the C group FS is to be mounted read write, then the runtime should change the owner of the container C group to the host UID that maps to the UID of the process that the um, container, the, the process that is the container entry point uh, in the user namespace. Hmm. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, TLDR, it will chain the C group to the user that corresponds to root inside the container's user namespace um, in the common case. It's a little more nuanced than that. Uh, what actually gets choned? Uh, the C group directory itself, so that system D or the container process can create new uh, sub C groups, you know, new scopes, new slices. Uh, and only the other files mentioned in syskernel cgroup delegate uh, so that it can move processes and threads into and out of the cgroups uh, in, um, in its cgroup namespace. Uh, why only these ones? Because if you chone everything in the container C group, it would allow the container to elevate its own resource limits and do other things that it should not be allowed to do. Uh, we need to use C groups V2, and uh, this is required for secure C group delegation. Uh, 
cgroups v2 is implemented it works but it is not yet the default configuration but it is on the roadmap so how to configure the cluster in openshift we use an object uh, type called machine config um, we need to specify kernel arguments to turn on cgroups v2 we need to change a couple of files that uh, specify allowed ranges of host UIDs that can be mapped to, uh, to child uh, user ID namespaces. And uh, we also need to deploy a, uh, an experimental version of RunC because uh, the RunC changes have not yet made their way into a release. So we use a systemd unit um, to do that, and that systemd unit will run RPM OS tree override replace if the uh, desired version of RunC is not yet present on that node. Okay, demo time. So I have here a cluster. I only deployed this cluster about an hour ago. Um, uh, so you get um, machine config. There is a machine config here um, that I already deployed. This is the one, IDM 4.10. So the three slides that I just showed you, uh, that's that machine config. Yeah, there's, there's a lot more information in the um, when viewing the object. Uh, hang on, uh, IDM 4.10. Sorry, I was showing all machine configs. So here's the here's the data that um, that was in the last few slides. Uh, I'm going to create a new project called test. I'm going to create a user called test. Uh, I'm going to assign edit permissions on this project to user test to allow it to create pods. I'm going to assign it the NEUID SCC, which is the workaround that we need to be able to admit uh, a pod that's using user namespaces and running as uh, UID zero in the user namespace, uh, even though it will map to unprivileged users. And I will create a pod uh, with a systemd container just running Nginx. And uh, this is the, the same as I showed you on uh, the slide with the example pod spec for using user namespaces. In particular, there are those two annotations. So if we have a look at the pod uh, and particular attributes, so the node name, what node has it been scheduled on, and uh, what are the statuses of the containers in that pod, we can see we're running on this worker node, so worker node A, and the pod is running. And Let's now open a debug shell on that worker node and have a poke around and see what's happening under the hood. And we're going to need to copy the container ID or uh, the prefix of that. Uh, we need to root to host on the worker node. And now we can run uh, cry control, which is a tool for interacting with uh, the container runtime uh, on the worker node inspect the ID and we'll use JQ to just pull out the PID of the process. Now, if we do cat uh, proc that PID, so 65317 UID map, uh, what this file shows us is that UID zero inside the user namespace of this process is mapped to UID 200,000 on the host. It's 200,000 because the modifications to Etsy sub UID and Etsy sub GID that we used, um, that's just the start, the allowable range of assignments. So as the first uh, container using a namespace that was created, that's where it uh, started to allocate the um, host UIDs from. And the size of the range is 65536 as requested.
Now, uh, if we have a look at the processes running in the container, we can do, uh, let's see, pgrep uh, double dash ns. This means show me all of the processes uh, running in the same set of namespaces as process 63517. Let's pipe that to xargs uh, ps dash o. We'll just have a look at the user, the PID, and the command line, and sort by PID. So this is what's running in the container in it. That's system D. We see a bunch of other system D uh, daemons running. Uh, and then toward the end, Nginx, the master process and, and the workers for the Nginx server. So this is a system D based container uh, running in the user namespace. The last thing to look at is the uh, um, C group. So if we do uh, OC RSH, so remote shell for running commands inside the container, pod nginx. I think I'm almost out of time, so uh, it will suffice to demonstrate that sysfs c group uh, inside the container is owned by root and its inode is not the inode of sysfs c group uh, on the host or in the host c group namespace which is inode 1. Um, if you were to find this directory uh, from the host point of view, actually, we can have a look here. Um, uh, ALI sysfsc group. Uh, we can see that only those files that were allowed to be uh, shown, so init.scope, memory.oom.group, um, the directory itself are owned by root inside this user namespace. Everything else is nobody. It's actually root in the host user namespace, but as that's unmapped, um, unmapped UIDs get interpreted as UID 65534, which is the nobody user. Okay, so that concludes the demo. Uh, here's a slide with some links to resources, including the main repo for this project, which doesn't have much in it yet, but we intend to expand that. My experimental run C builds are, whoops, uh, at um, my homepage on Fedora. Uh, team blogs, I blog extensively about all of this uh, research and development that I'm doing. So if you look at the containers tag on my blog, you'll find a lot of interesting stuff. I have a YouTube video of the demo um, with a bit more stuff in it than what I was able to just show you. And the future, um, the user namespace support in Kubernetes itself is an ongoing discussion. On OpenShift, we can use the annotation-based user namespace support, um, and we can use system with that, uh, combined with the uh, feature to chone the container C group, which at the moment is in an, in an experimental build, um, then you can do it, as I've just demonstrated. But the question of official support is still an ongoing discussion that we're having with the OpenShift project, with its product management. And we are looking for allies, in, that is other teams in a similar boat to us with legacy applications that would benefit from these features um, being matured and released and officially supported in OpenShift. Um, at the end of the day, we might not get what we want and we may end up having to re-architect free IPA for the cloud and that would not be the end of the world, but uh, we're hoping that we can continue pressing on the path um, that I've been speaking about in this presentation. And that concludes well, thank it. Thank you very much, Fraser. I know I've certainly hit the the container root requirement mapping issue multiple times in the last several years. Um, and, and as you said, ideally, you just don't do that. But that's not always the life we live, unfortunately. Um, we, we have kind of run out of time, so there was a few questions. Um, we'll drop them into the chat window, and um, Michael uh, and Fraser 
hopefully we'll be able to sort that out as we get prepared for the next speaker who is going to be coming up very shortly. We've got 10 minutes of changeover, so go grab a drink and we'll see you back in 10. Thank you.